particular, um, you know, we said as the, the objectives for the course at the start, it's a combination. Here, I can move my switcher. The course is a combination of providing you with knowledge of software engineering and some knowledge of data analysis and biology. And there are a couple of a couple of specific topics we cover. One of them is Michaelis Menten uh, and some kinetics. And just a show of hands, uh, those who have heard this before, before this class, Michaelis Menten. Okay, most people, wonderful. Okay, so hopefully uh, the familiar will be there. I'm, I, you know, the basic concepts I think are simple, but as long as you've had a uh, exposure to it before, that's great. Okay, so the agenda for today. I'm going to start out with the background on kinetics, a little quick review of, of some simple biochemistry. Um, and this will sort of motivate what comes, what follows after that. When you're doing any sort of data analysis, plots are crucial. And then we'll talk about this, you know, the extending the software concepts to scripts and functions. And then we'll actually get into that data analysis of the enzyme kinetics, and hopefully that will be revealing for you. Okay, so enzyme kinetics, um, you know, basic chemistry, a reaction. Well, you have um, a lot of times it's reactants go to products, or I'm calling it it's um, in, in this case uh, substrates because uh, that's the terminology that's used in, uh, for enzymes. So you have a bunch of things on the left, which are chemical species. They go to a bunch of things on the right that are chemical species. Enzymes, what they do, they're kind of catalysts. They're going to accelerate the reaction. So you have the same reaction. It's just that the enzyme appears on both sides. It does not get consumed. It's still available. And that's the definition of a catalyst. It's something that does not get consumed. It's, it's a part of, uh, but it accelerates the reaction. Um, and the observation is that much of what is done with drug design is about somehow modifying the behavior of enzymes. And typically the way that's done is by putting other chemical species um, into, into the cell, into the bloodstream, so that the, catal so that the catalyst is inhibited. It doesn't work as well. Or uh, potentially, you know, in other cases, in, in, there's some way you might accelerate things too. But that's really what a lot of drug design is about. And so when you, you think about it that way, then understanding how enzymes work and be able to quantify whether or not you've actually, for example, inhibited an enzyme and to what extent is really important because that's going to be the basic of talking about whether or not a drug is effective or just basically understanding cell biology. Okay, so a... Um, a catalyst, uh, imagine this is from, you know, introductory chemistry. Imagine you're all familiar with this kind of chart. You start out with reactants, or I call them substrates, to be consistent with the enzyme terminology. At one level of, of energy, free energy, Gibbs free energy, that's all familiar. I see a lot of nods, great. So that's what the y-axis is. The uncatalyzed reaction requires a high activation energy. And that's also, I'm sure, familiar to all of you. And the catalyzed reaction, uh, the activation energy is much lower. You still end up with the same products. So the you know, energy loss or energy gain is the same. The thermodynamics overall, the reaction don't change. But what happens is the reaction goes faster because you've lowered the activation energy. And that's the principle behind it. So the next part is really about you know, how catalysts do this. Now, and again, I imagine for most of you this is pretty familiar, although maybe the diagram is formed. So that this gray blobbish thing here is an enzyme. And you see it at various states here. So we start out with a substrate, something that's going to be on the left-hand side of the reaction. And what happens is that substrate somehow becomes attached, bonds to the enzyme for a period of time. Because of that bonding, the enzyme will change, what's called an induced fit. It's conformation. Is that a familiar word? OK, conformation. The enzyme will change its shape because of the effect of that substrate that's bonded. As a result, a reaction takes place. Reactions are a result of, of chemical species coming together. And if it happens randomly, it can be really slow because the chance of hitting another species the right way is pretty low. But if you have an enzyme in the middle that bonds and orients the, the substrate, the, 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 uh, the chemical species the right way, it'll happen much faster. And that's the reason why uh, enzymes work so well. Um, there are enzymes are an example of what's called a biological catalyst. They're from proteins. Proteins are biological molecules. And they're, of course, non-biological catalysts as well. Typically, a non-biological catalyst will accelerate a reaction on the order of maybe 100 times, 10 to 100 times, something like that. Any idea about what, how much, what factor of acceleration you get with, a, with an enzyme? What is the range there? 
It, it, it can be anywhere from a million to like 10 to the 15th. I mean, it's incredible how, fat, how much these are. Enzymes can accelerate reactions in, in, to an, an incredible extent. Um, and it's really what makes life possible. It's the reason why many reactions don't take place unless the right enzyme is present. Um, the other thing about enzymes is they're very specific. That induced fit that happens, it only happens because of molecules of certain shapes or, electro uh, or electromagnetic properties, uh, you know, whether you know, there are uh, magnetic fields or um, electrical fields, dipoles and the like. So enzymes are very specific they have, uh, and, and they have a great impact. The way this is written a lot of times to actually, I'm showing here with one substrate. Obviously, you could have many substrates and similarly many products, but I'll just work with one substrate, one product. Is that in this case over here, you have the enzyme and the substrate, they're separate. And this one right here, what happened is that we formed an enzyme substrate complex. They're bound together, and that's why the, the two letters are bound together. It's actually, you can almost view this as a new chemical species. They're bound together. And then the reaction takes place, that, that substrate's converted to product, they're still bound together, and then they separate. Okay, so the, the lines here I'm sure you're familiar with, this shows which way the reaction's going. There's a lot of variations on this. I chose one particular variation to be consistent with Michaelis Menten and the, uh, the assumptions they make, but this assumes over here that um, this reaction is reversible, so you could go from here to here or from there to there, even though this arrow only shows it going one way. And then from here on out, it just shows it going one direction. Depending on the nature of the enzyme and the substrate, you can have things that you, know, you really have to consider as being bidirectional. But for our purposes and for the analysis we're doing, we'll, we'll assume this model. Okay. The quantity, one of the quantities we'll be very interested in is the reaction rate, because that's what the enzyme's there for. It's to accelerate that reaction rate. So that's, we'll call that V. Okay, so then the Michaelis-Menten model of enzyme kinetics is about how do we quantify the reaction rate here. Now, those of you who've taken biochemistry, which I assume is most of you, um, you know, it's a standard derivation. This is done in the notes. I point to one of these derivations. It's pretty straightforward, a uh, pretty simple set of assumptions that they make. I'm not going to go through that. I'm, I'm just going to give you the result. And, and we'll, we'll interpret this sort of intuitively. Okay, so what this says is that the reaction rate is equal to Vmax, which is the maximum reaction rate, times this, you know, essentially this ratio, that the amount of substrate divided by this other constant over here plus the amount of substrate. So if we think about that, what does that mean? Well, let's go back over here to this diagram here. So what happens when we have a whole lot of substrate? We, we flood with, the term is flooding. We flood with substrate. What's going to be, what's going to be the likely state for the enzymes over here? Where is it, where's it going to spend much of its time? Well, mostly it's going to be either here or here, right? Because as soon as you let something go, you got more substrate around. It's going to bind with it. So you're going to do a lot of this right over here. So that would mean that that's probably about as fast as you possibly can go. You flood this with substrate, you're always going to be in the either the bound or you know I'm releasing the product state of the enzyme product and substrate. So that's the reason why in, in this equation over here, as S goes to infinity, then V equals V max, because you basically have infinity over infinity. These two cancel out. The Km doesn't mean anything, and just V equals V max. So that's one part about this. And then the other part about this is the Km. That takes a little more interpretation. It basically it's going to be talking to you about um, the rate at which, you know, the sort of the shape of that curve, and I'll get to that in just a second. So V max is the maximum rate, and Km tells you about the shape. It tells you the it's really the, the amount of substrate you need for the reaction to go at one half the maximum rate. And let me explain this on the next slide. It's a picture is really the best way to do this. So um, this is a plot here. I got the formula like before. This is a plot here where the substrate is on the x-axis and the reaction rate is on the y-axis. And here's Vmax. And why is it that the curve, and here's the reaction rate, the reaction rate under the michaelis menten assumptions. Why is it that the reaction rate goes up to, and sort of, this is the asymptote over here, the Vmax? It's not a hard question. There's nothing subtle here. Yeah. Yeah, it's when the enzyme gets saturated. That's the maximum amount. So you can't go higher than that. Okay. 
So over here, let's take a look at Km and what, see what that means. So the definition of Km is it's a concentration of S of the substrate. So obviously it has to be in units here of the x-axis, where the reaction rate is one half of Vmax. So what you do intuitively is say, OK, let's start at the y-axis, look at Vmax, go halfway down, go over here to the curve, and then go down here to the x-axis. That's Km. It's a value of S where the reaction rate is one half of the maximum. Okay, these are the two concepts I'm going to work with right now. Vmax is pretty intuitive. I'll tell you, Km takes a little while longer to, to think about. Um, but for right now, just think of it as it's a concentration of Ks. It's a characteristic of the enzyme, at least of that concentration. And um, if you want a reaction that's a fa if you want your reaction to go faster, would you want Km to be larger or smaller? Smaller. And why would you? Someone tell me why it should be smaller. Well, if it's smaller, I mean, let's just look at the formula over here. We can do it from the formula. That's a great way to do it. If, if it's smaller here, then this denominator is smaller. The denominator is smaller, then the ratio is larger. And then V is larger. And intuitively, what it means is I need less substrate to get a faster reaction. That's intuitively what it means. OK, that's really about as much as I'm going to do on the background. Everything now on is going to be more about the analysis of this. And how many of you have worked in a lab and tried to find for an enzyme uh, Vmax and Km? OK, so a couple, one or two. All right, that's excellent. I'm glad to see that. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll find this interesting. Okay, so I, I do give a reference to a paper where this is done. It's in the notes. Um, here's an example of a paper that's um, looking at a particular gene uh, that produces an enzyme. Uh, the, the gene is actually CT390. The enzyme that's coded is... is uh, is what they're studying here. And they're looking at its effect on various different substrates under you know, different conditions. And so what you see is, is curves that of slightly different shapes, but they all look like this michaelis menten curve. And what they're trying to find in the study in this paper is to look for Vmax and Km. So this is really a core part of biochemical analysis. I give this both as an example. And I'll use the data in this particular plot here as my running example. Um, and so the, the uh, THDPA um, will be the substrate we'll be looking at, and the, the enzyme will be the CT390 coded enzyme. Um, I will confess in advance, the numbers I, don't, I come up with are not exactly the same as what you see in the paper, and that's because they didn't actually print their data. I had to sort of extract it from the plot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish they did, but <laughs> yeah, Dave and I are both involved with some efforts to have um, research, scientific research be reproducible, and a core part of that is publishing your data, right? So you shouldn't have to do this. You should be able to get to the data. In any case, okay. All right, so now we're going to go through, and now you've gotten sort of the science background. Everything from now on out is going to be a mix of sort of programming and data analysis. And so let's start from a sort of a data analysis perspective. Suppose we want to estimate Vmax and Km from that first plot, that, that, that TP, uh, DPA or THDPA uh, data. So this is my you know, reconstruction of the data. OK, so what we'd like to do is we've got some data here. It's taken from a lab. So it's imperfect data. You know, it's not exactly a curve. I mean, a curve wouldn't go like bounce around like that. And somehow we want to estimate Km and Vmax. That's our goal. OK, so um, any thoughts about, OK, so well, let me, let me go ahead about how to do this and, and a little bit, because I know some of you have done this to some degree and are probably familiar with some of the aspects. So let me, let me go through step by step. There's a standard approach to doing this sort of manually. Um, and that's called the lineweaver burke plot. How many people have run into that? OK, large fraction of you. I mean, this is, again, it's a good. That, that's standard practice is to teach about this as well. So, this plot, for those of you who haven't, let me go through this because I don't want to go through it too fast. It's a little bit confusing potentially on the first pass of what's going on here. We have this equation here where we're trying to find Vmax and Km. And it's sort of difficult because they're mixed together in that ratio, this ratio right over here uh, combined together. What we'd like to do is somehow tease that apart where we can deal with them separately. And the way this is done is by just a simple arithmetic transformation of this equation. <coughs> There's nothing that's changed in the basic equation. It's the same equation, but we're going to do something really simple to make it so that we can get the pieces of it. 
And this is going to sound strange, but it actually works out amazingly well. What we're going to do is we're going to take the inverse of both sides. So instead of looking at v, we're going to look at 1 over v. Instead of this ratio here, we're going to look at 1 over this ratio. So it's equivalent to this. With I, And I, there's a little bit of arithmetic I did too. So you can work this out on your own. I mean, when you take you know, 1 over v and then you've got this, you're going to have a km plus s over this. And then the s over s is going to cancel. It gives you the 1. So you end up with something that looks like this. So 1 over v equals 1 over v max plus km over v max times 1 over s. It's just straightforward arithmetic. Just take the inverse and a little bit of manipul manipulation. Now, what's interesting about this is that now if we think of our variables as being the x variable on the x-axis is 1 over s, and the y variable is 1 over v, now we have a line. OK? I want to pause for just a second for those of you who haven't run into this before, because if you haven't seen it before, it takes a second. And this is actually a crucial point in terms of what we'll do with the data analysis. So do you see what I mean? That this actually becomes, you know, a line, the formula for a line is y equals b plus ax. Okay, so this is y. This is b. This is going to be the y-intercept. Here's x. That's 1 over s. And here's the slope. So if you look at it, and you could find you know, this value here and this value here, you'd have a line that fits the data, in the inverted data. I mean, that's the key thing here. This is the inverted data. Okay? So I see some puzzled looks. Ask me a question. See, I want to understand where it is that people are, are puzzled. Okay? Or is it just heavy concentration? Please, yeah. Yes, right. Okay. So actually, the way it works, actually, that's even on my next slide right here, uh, next point right here. So this over here, and this is all in the notes too, and, and we are making videos, so, um, so hopefully you'll be able to get it there. So the intercept, the y-intercept is the 1 over v max, and then the slope of the line, which is the, the um, term that multiplies times 1 over s, because now 1 over s, or we're looking at this THDPA data, um, that is the x-axis. Then this slope here is this value right there. Yes? Okay, so why do we have to make it linear? Why couldn't we do some other kind of line? You could. I mean, the, the, um, the problem is we don't know. Um, I mean, um, this particular form works out very nicely for doing linear least squares regression. Um, you could do it other ways as well. Um, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, what you want is just something where there are good statistical techniques to be able to analyze it. But other possibilities, other approaches are, are possible as well. Other questions? OK. All right. So our goal now, we've, we've somewhat simplified the problem. Because now, instead of trying to fit this nonlinear curve over here and figure out, you know, guess the right Vmax and Km, now we've got a line. And they're well understood techniques for fitting lines to data. How many people here have done linear regression before? OK, wonderful. OK, so this is not foreign to you. That's, that's excellent. OK. So um, you probably know that whenever you're going to do any kind of data analysis, one of the first steps is just to do some plots. Okay, I showed you some plots here. Um, those are great starting points. But you know, clearly, you're going to want to do some plots in MATLAB. So what we're going to do next is we're going to do some plotting. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the functions. And then we'll get back to this data analysis. All right, so some plotting stuff. So um, if you have, um, let's see. Um, people here, how many people have installed MATLAB or Octave have access to it? Okay, it's a wonderful. People are doing great. Okay, sometimes the graphics becomes, you know, another thing to deal with. Sometimes it's not immediately there. Um, so if you have Windows, the graphics should work pretty straightforward. There's some um, description about that. Uh, for both for Octave, the online versions have some examples of that too. How many of you have tried using graphics, doing a plot already? Okay, one or so. Okay, yeah, you have to check this out. There's there's information on the software tab um, as well, so this should all work. So um, let's start here. Um, we're going to to look at just this data here, um, and so this is the data that I sort of retrofitted from the plot. Um, so here, the way this is encoded here. Well, actually, tell me what this. Um, 
Okay, tell me what this is, this, this uh, matrix that I've got there. Can you give me a size? What's the shape of it? Yeah, it's two columns and how many rows? Six. Exactly. It's two by six. And so uh, the way this works out is that the first column is going to be x. Or it's, and, and x, in this case, remember, is 1 over THDPA. Uh, I'm sorry. No, this is the raw data. I apologize. This is the raw data. We're, we haven't gotten there yet. So uh, the first column is THDPA, and the second column is going to be reaction rate. OK? So if you want to do a plot in MATLAB, um, you know, generally the, the verb plot is you know, your starting point. Uh, there are variations as well. Um, and in general, the vectors have to be the same. So I assume that many of you have in, encountered this verb before. One just sort of side comment. Whenever you're designing software, it's always good to have verbs that are natural. And so saying plot is plot is really good. Um, this may sound obvious right now, but if you build a complex software system, if you're doing some sort of biochemical modeling, you'd want to make sure that you have verbs that are meaningful to your users. So um, no, just generally a good principle. Okay, so here's a plot of the data. Um, you know, okay, I guess that's a starting point, but just from the point of view of aesthetics and trying to say, gee, I'd like to share this with other people, there are probably a few things you'd like to change. What do you think you'd like to do to sort of dress this up a bit? Axes, axes, titles, labels, okay. What else? Make a, and why would you want a scatter plot? Yeah, the lines are sort of misleading here, aren't they? Because it sounds like there's continuous values and in fact only have data at visual points. Jen, you had another comment? Okay, any, any other? Yeah, I agree with all of those. Um, you know, probably larger fonts you'd like to have, maybe even, what the heck, go, give it a title so you know what it is. You know, sort of go all out. And, and again, you know, MATLAB does this in pretty reasonable ways. I mean, there's not, you know, you, there are so many variations on what you can do with MATLAB plots. It's very, very rich. And I'm, I'm not going to bore you by going through all of them. If you just um, go to um, the, um, um, mat, if you just say in MATLAB or go online and say MATLAB plot, um, it'll give you a list of the options. And you can play with this interactively and see what it is you actually come up with. But I mean, this is something probably a little bit more reasonable. We have scatter plots over here. The other thing that I, I think is often reasonable too is pick reasonable ranges of values for the x and y axes. Because you can make things look very different. You can make something look like there's a very strong relationship. And in fact, you know, you've got really a horizontal line. It's not something that really means much. It's just that your scale is in units of you know, 0 0.001 or something like that. So you, you probably want to do all of that. But those are, those are sort of like intuitive ideas. Okay, now the other thing that you might want to do is if you want to show a trend, okay, we've got the data as um, individual points, a scatter plot, but we may want to connect those points together with a line. And that, that's a little, you know, a variation on that. And at least, you know, you may or may not want to do that, but it's, um, it's something useful to know how to do. So at that point, at that stage, when we're going to do that, what we're doing is something that's really very powerful visually, is what we're going to do is we're going to overlay one plot on another plot. <clears throat> okay, so, I mean, ultimately what we're going to want to do is take that, what, however we figure out the Vmax and the Km, we'd like to overlay that fitted line, that fitted curve to these data. I mean, that, and actually that will be your homework. And that's sort of where we're going with this. I mean, that's what you'd really like to see is how the fitted curve relates to the raw data. But for right now, just as an illustrative example, we'll just do a line that connects so that you understand, so that if you aren't familiar with this, you, you can see how it works. And basically what you do is if you say hold, that means keep the current plot, or figure is really what MATLAB calls this, and then do this other plot. And by keeping the current plot, that means don't change the x and y axis, don't change the fonts, just add this other line within that context. And then that's what, this is what you end up with then, is these uh, dots connected by the line. So, and there, like I said, there are many, many variations on plot. Do help plot or look online. You get bar plots. You can, uh, you can combine bar plots with other plots. Obviously, you get scatter plots. You could have lines with different colors and, and different, um, uh, different kinds of line types. So, okay. I'm not going to say a lot more on plot because I think it's you know, really more a matter of just suiting to your needs, and then you, it's really more about you looking at the reference material as you need it. I think that what I've given you here is probably most of what people use. So, any questions on this part? Yes. 
Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, oh, this? Okay, yeah, this was actually, let me repeat this, because this was actually something I um, went over a bit in the last lecture, but it was fast. And, you know, feel free to, to go back and, and look at you know, these segments of the video. Um, so what's going on here, this is a way of addressing uh, matrices in MATLAB. So the basic data structure in MATLAB is a matrix. And so what do you want to do with a matrix? You want to pick up some sub-matrix of it. It could be, you know, some sub-block, you know, like if I have a 10 by 10 matrix, I want, may want to have uh, rows 2 through 3 and columns 4 through 5. Yeah, so that's what you want to do in MATLAB. The colon here says take everything in that row, but only use the first column. I'm sorry, it take, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, right, I'm using, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so what, what, I'm doing, uh, what I'm doing here is this should be the, the first column and it will take everything in all the rows. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is like a wild card. So there's no restriction on the row and use, the, use everything in the first column. So with that, um, yeah, that would be, I don't uh, have to go back to the other one. Oh, let's see if I, actually let me just give you an example. Okay, so if I have a matrix here, Rows and columns like this. So every every dot here is is a value. So, or actually, let's do it as, as the cells are values. These are all values. Okay. So here and let me do it with do it the same shape actually as what we have over there. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Let's do six. Okay. So we've got rows one, two, three, four, five, six. Columns one and two. Okay. So uh, data colon comma one says use any row but only the first column. So it's this. Okay. How about if we were asking for um, if we wanted to do all all columns in the second row? What would we what would be uh, the way we would uh, specify that? I'm sorry. Two comma colon. So that's the same principle, the second row, but everything there. Right, right. Now the other thing that you can do, I mean if we added more over here, let's see, suppose we have three and four, what would this be? Data on uh, let's say two to three and on um, two to three. Where would I be in the matrix then? So what that's saying is that um, do the second and third rows and the second and third columns. So I've got this right here. Okay. This is a, a, an important part of, this is actually one of the key features of MATLAB, being able to do this kind of addressing. And take a look at the, the last week's lecture. There's, um, there's some more detail on this. Other questions? Okay, good. All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, functions and scripts. So um, how many here have written a MATLAB script? OK, so over half. OK, so scripts, you know, something. It's a block of code that you're going to reuse. Dave gave an example of a bash script um, early on um, in his uh, lecture on, or actually towards the middle or end of the lecture, on um, Git and bash. Um, it allows you to save the workflow that you did. And similarly, you can do the same thing in MATLAB. OK, so um, here's an example. Um, we're going to create a, um, the way you do it is you go about it and you uh, create a new file. Um, and um, this file is going to have an extension .m for, for MATLAB. And uh, you just put your code inside that file. And then you can, uh, then you can run the code. So um, do this as a demo. I think that that will be more interesting and, and probably get a little bit more interaction going to. So... Um, Let's see here. That's that's which one? Here we go. Plot script. All right. And I got rid of this for now. Okay. All right. So here's an example of a script. Um, we're gonna plot the data. Uh, so we have the same notation like we just saw before. This is gonna be a scatter plot. Um, and this is gonna be the x-axis. This is the y-axis. And we specify the axis range. And then if we go over here, and that's called plot underscore script, and we just type in um, plot underscore script, we come up with a result. 
Okay, so, so let's think about this for a second. And all I did was it's, it's in a file. You know, so I have a, an editor over here open where I'm putting this in. We can change things. Um, so it, it, that's one of the nice things about it. So let's do something interesting like let's make the x-axis much bigger and then the y-axis much smaller uh, in terms of the font size. And you have to make sure you save the file. And then you go over here and then you can uh, do the same thing again. Plot underscore script. Okay, and so what should happen here is you see the x-axis is really big and the y-axis, the label, is very small. Okay, there's not a lot more to it than this. You have a file. The file is named with whatever you're going to, you know, however you're going to call it in MATLAB. Oh, one other thing that's important. That file has to live in the directory where you are invoking MATLAB. Now, there's some, there's some variations on this. There, there's something called, you know, search paths that you can add. But really, for your purposes, for what you're doing, I'm assuming that when you're working on a particular homework, for example, you'll have a directory called homework, let's say, 3 or homework 4. And you'll write a few, you'll create a few files, maybe using Sublime or some other editor. You'll name them with, let's say, plot.m or whatever you're going to use. And then you're going to invoke it because you're going to run MATLAB in that directory. And then that way the script will then be available. MATLAB will know about what's ever in that directory. Okay. All right, so that's the basics of scripts. Um, Okay, so then you can use it, and this is the example, and that's how you run it. All right, so one of the th challenges with scripts as opposed to functions is um, a script's not very adaptable. Okay, and by that I mean, well, if, you go, if we go back and look at this script, um, back and forth, but I think that that will be, still be helpful. If we go back and look at this script over here, and that's, I'm going to reset this because those are crazy font sizes. Okay, you know, what we see is that this script works for just this data. If I wanted, suppose I wanted to plot something else. Suppose I get um, x equals, let's say, um, point, uh, 0.1 times, um, let's do 1 to 10, and uh, y equals sine of x. And so, you know, I want to do plots of, let's say, um, x comma y. Here's my x and y. Okay, so I can do that. But, you know, suppose I wanted to take advantage of maybe x and y were other experimental data that I got, and I wanted to plot it too. So what I'd like to do is plot this x and y. But in order to do that, what do I have to do? Well, I have to go over here, and I say, okay, well, let's edit this over here. And I'm going to put in x and y, and now I have to save it. And now I can go back to my window over here, and I can, I can uh, then do um, this plot again, plot script. Okay, and so now I have this, this other data over here, but that was sort of painful. How many times do I have to do this editing? So we'd like to get beyond that. I mean, in addition, if we really want to extend our capabilities, the capabilities of MATLAB, and, and, or any programming environment, extend it, not only do we want to be able to specify different values coming in, we also want to be able to have results returned. I mean, we'd like to use it just like, well, like the sine function, for example. Sine of 0.1 returns a value. And I can do things like, say, cosine of 0.1 uh, times sine of 0.1 because they both return a value. I'd like to be able to do that with my functions too, because that's you know I want to use them in calculations. I don't want to always be assigned to a variable, always know that it's someplace else. So, so those are the things that functions will provide us with a way to pass values, and also a way to um, be able to um, uh, be able to get values returned. So the way we do this in MATLAB is that. Um, <coughs> You have to, you, we describe it a little bit differently. So I'm going to transform, uh, I probably should just call this something different for the purposes of this exercise. And we'll call this um, uh, plot uh, example. I think I already have something called plot function. Okay. So now this, we're going to turn this into a function. And the way we're going to do this is, first of all, well, we have to call the function. We type in function. And then the next thing is, well, right now our function wants to take two arguments. 
The arguments are essentially variables that are presented to us. So when I say plot x, y, x and y are arguments. They have some value in the context in which that was invoked. And when they're passed to the function, they're going to have an interpretation over here. So now when I say plot underscore ex, I want to be able to pass these values. So first of all, I have to name it. You always want to use the same name as um, uh, the name of the file. So this file is plot underscore ex. And so we want to use that same name here. And then we list the arguments. Okay. So now these arguments here will be or represent whatever gets passed to plot ex. And then that can be used internally. They are not defined inside of this program. They are defined externally. Okay, So I'm going to save this. And let's see what happens now when we use it. So now we're going to do um, plot underscore ex, x comma y. So actually, you know what? Let me do this a little bit differently. Let's say x1 equals x and y1 equals y. The reason why I'm doing this is I want to point out that the names that you use when you invoke the function have nothing to do with the names inside the function. They're different. It's called a name scope. And so when I say plot, plot x1 comma y1, this, and let's see what happens. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Plot underscore ex, that's the name of my function. x1 comma y1. Okay, so what happened here? And so we got the right result, which is great. I actually was hoping I, I had an error right now, which I don't. Um, okay, so what, what happened here? Well, x1 became x because that was the first argument. And y1 became y because that's the second argument. And then when we said plot x, y over here, it's plotting x1 and y1 because that's the way it got assigned. And I think that this notion of what's called a formal argument, you know, and its relationship to what gets passed is one of the more confusing things <coughs> that happens here. Now, a um, couple things, yes? So the point of all this function inside the script, what do you call it? Do you call function Okay, so, oh, so when you call it inside a script, you do it just like you do it on the command line. You would call it just as plot underscore ex, exactly the same way. Okay, other questions? Yes, right, exactly. And that's the other thing is it has to be in the same directory where you invoke MATLAB or, or Octave, you know, whichever system you're using. Yeah, because that's, that's the way it knows, that's how it finds it, is it looks in local directory. There is this generalization called a search path. I won't go into that. Other questions? Yes? So if you, uh, if you change things, so you change things in the No, they don't. Okay, let's. That, good question. Because I, I, I think you're hitting on points that people find confusing. Is you know the association of these names. So we can call this um, um, a uh, equals. I'm just doing this because it's e easy way to get the values rather than me doing it uh, another way. And if I say plot um, a comma b, it still works. Okay. So again, the the way you make the association of the variables that you have when you call the function with what's used in the function is by the order in which those variables are, are set in, in arguments that are passed. Here, here's another one we could do. How about this? We won't even use a variable. What we'll do is we'll define things. We'll do a, a 1 to 6. So this is going to be the numbers 1 through 6. And um, then what I'm going to do here is 1 to 6. And if you're familiar with this, I think I have to do this. This says raise it, raise all those to the uh, square all those. Okay. I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I apologize. I probably should have used a different name. Yes, thank you. So it's plot. Well, at least I know that works. Plot, thank you, ex. And let's do the same thing. 1 to 6, comma, 1 to 6, and then raise to the second power. All right, so plot ex. So now I should come up with, um, OK. So why doesn't that show anything? What's the problem? The axes are wrong, right? So I mean that also goes to show you. I mean this is something which it's a very common mistake. So, um, but but um, I, it did pass the values. It just didn't use the right axes. I'm um, actually, you know what? 
Um, let's use this as an example to sort of go through and explore this a little bit. So suppose I actually wanted to make this a more general plot routine. And I say, well, gee, I better not specify the axis values in advance. What would I change in this code? Yeah? The yellow numbers. The, like this over here? Or? Uh, row 5? OK. So maybe if I just, I'm going to comment it out rather than delete it. A uh, uh, percent is a comment. OK. So then if we go back over here, we tried it again. OK. So now we see the points. OK. Does that make sense, what we've done there? All right. So what we've done, um, let's do one more variation on this, because there's another part of this. this. It all has one of the most confusing things about functions, I think is the relationship between the names, the variables you used inside the function, and the variables outside. And to some extent, functions are intended to be, um, the, the computer science term is it's a form of encapsulation and, or in, and information hunting. What you're trying to do is make it so that it's an isolated closed system. And the only way of communication is through the arguments that you pass, in this case x and y, and any value that's returned. We haven't talked about return values yet. We're just talking about passing arguments. All right. So um, let's do um, one more thing over here. Suppose, and this is going to be sort of weird and arbitrary, um, I'm going to do the, um, OK, so we've done this. I'll tell you what. This is going to be a, um, a different kind of function. OK, so this function, what I'm going to do is I'm going, I still want, I want to pass, I want to plot the data, that experimental data that we had before. That's what I want to do. But I'm playing with it. I want to plot it with different factors for uh, the x-axis. So I'm going to scale the x-axis a different way. And I'll just call this scale. That's going to be my argument, scale. What is the scale of the x-axis that I want? So instead of having this plot x comma y, um, what I'm actually going to plot is I'm going to plot uh, the data like I had before. I'm going to want to scale the x-axis, so and then data, comma one, and then data, comma two, and I'll also do it as um, as before with a scatter plot. Okay, does that make sense? What I'm doing there? I'm plotting the same data, but my function does something different. This time, my function is about scaling. It's not about choosing different values to plot. Because I would just always want to use data. Okay? All right, so now when I do this, let's go back and so now plot has different arguments. So if I say plot underscore ex and I said, let's say x1, comma y1, okay, well, first of all, let's see what happens. Okay, so why did I get that error? Yes. And why are they invalid? Right, I change the arguments to the function. This is not a function that takes two arguments anymore. It only takes one. Okay? All right, so, and, and the other reason is which, you know, I could use one argument, but I actually, well, let's just use one argument. Okay? Well, okay, fine. I'll fix this. I'll just use one argument. Ooh, what's going on here? And why is it an invalid data type? It says line two. So let's look at that. Let's look at this over here. Because this is going to be important for you to be able to read these errors and interpret them. Okay, um, it says on line two, uh, there was an error. Line two, column one. All right. So what's going on here? It's this plot over here. Okay. So the argument is scale. I passed in x one. What's the shape of x one? It's a it's a vector. Yeah. It's it's a six a vector of length six. And so this is scale. Then becomes a vector of length six. That I'm multiplying times this data thing over here, it just doesn't make sense. So clearly, I need a scalar. Okay, fine. So we'll use a simple scalar. Plot underscore ex one. One's a really easy scalar. Right. So this should just reproduce that data plot from before, right? Come up with a scatter plot. Oops. It's wrong again. What's going on here? What's wrong? It's line two. It's still line two. What's the problem? The pro Go ahead. 
I did not pass data into the function. Remember, a function creates this enclosed unit. It only knows about what you pass in. I passed in scale. Did not pass in data. So it doesn't know about data. Data is undefined. So on the other hand, if I put data in as an argument, and now I go back and, and do this again, plot underscore ex, and we'll use the scale of 1 and data, OK? And it still doesn't like it. What is I'm doing wrong here? OK. All right. Um, scale and data. Oh, I didn't save it. <laughs> That's a very common problem, too. I'm trying to demonstrate all the common problems you will encounter. And hopefully it will also level your threshold for concern about when you're making mistakes. There's so much detail here. It's very easy for anyone to make mistakes. And, and actually, fortunately, it was right this time. I mean, I can't even guarantee it could have been another problem, too. But this time it actually worked. OK? So, so what happened here was now, uh, hopefully this is, becomes more clear. A function only knows about what you pass in. Now, there are some exceptions to this. There's, there's a uh, MATLAB command called global, which will allow you to get at data that's outside the function. I highly recommend that you avoid using it. And the reason why is that um, it's much easier to debug a system that consists of isolated components than interconnected. And every time you put in a global there, you make a connection with something else. And it makes it very difficult. It's also very difficult to reuse because now if I want to use this function in like some other analysis code, I have to have the same set of globals. It becomes very difficult. So stay away from global. All right. Okay, now the last part of this, which is important for functions, mentioned before, functions, the other thing about functions which is so important is they return a value. Or they can. They don't have to. They can. So the way you declare that in MATLAB is you say that uh, the result is some something. I, I call it y. Well, I'll call it. You can you can name it anything you want. It just has to be a name that's unique uh, in your program here. Um, what would you like the result of this function to be? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call it the um, uh, result is equal to the size of data. Okay. It doesn't mean too much here, but um, you know, it, it at least demonstrates the principle. Okay, so now if we do plot underscore ex one comma data, um, and then let's say that our okay, let's see here. All right, so here's our plot. We saw that from before. Okay, and the result is six comma two because the size, the shape, of data is six comma two. Okay, so. You know, the, the way this works in general is that the function line here, when you create a function, it's all about this line up here. That's your, what's called the declaration line. You're telling the name of the function, which should be the same, na same name as the file name. You're telling the arguments, and these are arguments that are defined as you pass, date, as you pass uh, values to it, and you're telling it what it is that comes out. And you can do this in various ways. I mean, for example, you know, result doesn't have, it could also be done a little bit differently. Result could be like um, uh, two variables that you're going to return, row and column. And then you could do this differently instead of calling this result. So now it's looking for something called row and column. And um, I believe this is going to work. Yeah, this will work. Size of data. All right, let me save that. So the nice thing about this is, suppose you particularly wanted to get at the column, you know, you weren't interested in that that uh, vector, then you could you could do this directly. So you could say like r comma c equals plot underscore ex one comma data. Again, you get the plot, and then you get values for r and c, and then you could use c for some purpose. For example, you remember repmat, where we were creating, you know, a um, uh, basically, ma matrix or matrix or vector of a certain format, and say, well, I want a whole bunch of ones, and I should take the number of ones. The shape of that is going to be a vector of six uh, rows and one column, or or let's see, r r rows and c columns. So that'll have the same shape as data. I could do that. 
Okay, just to show you an application of this. Okay, does that make sense? That's a variation on what you can do about how you return things. You can actually specify individual dimensions. Okay, all right. So that's really about all I'm going to do on functions. I mean, that's really all you need to know that um, to different namespace where the only way you get names from outside in is passing those arguments. You can pass values back, you know, in, in complex formats. So you can pass a matrix, you can pass parts of a matrix, all sorts of things that you want to do. It allows you this kind of extensive. Okay. All right. So, so now we're going to continue with um, enzyme kinetics, the data analysis. So what we want to do is um, construct um, a curve and, and estimate uh, Km and Vmax for these data. So this was a substrate here, the first row, the THDPA. And then on the second row over here, we have the, um, uh, the reaction rates. And as we saw before, here's the raw data, here's the inverted data, and the way we're going to go about this is uh, we're going to fit a line to the inverted data. The y-intercept is going to be 1 over Vmax. And the slope, we're going to use the slope to compute k sub m. So here's the steps involved. Uh, we're going to you know, have to go through and show how we do in MATLAB converting the inverted, inverted data. There's some transformation of the data that's required. I'm going to fit a line to it, a couple of the parameters. Um, and then um, actually in your homework, you're going to show, you're going to actually do um, a plot of the fitted data in the Michaelis-Menten uh, equation using the estimates you obtained from step four. You're going to uh, show that plot um, with um, overlaid on the raw data. Okay, so the first step is to convert, uh, compute the raw data. Um, and we do this using the dot operator in uh, MATLAB uh, transforms. Um, it allows us to do a computation on each element in a matrix. The, um, let's see here. Okay, so that's this one over here. Okay, so that's the way the, uh, the dot operator works with matrix. Okay, let's go back to that. Slides. You have to compute these inverted values, and um, as mentioned before, if you're in, you know with with matrix multiplication, that works in a similar way. Um, A times B is you multiply the matrices together. A dot times B is is term by term. Okay. Now, the next step is really the setup to do the linear regression. Again, I'm doing this in a lot more detail than you probably you would need, but it's, it's really to express the point about how do you shape matrices in the right way to get the right set of data types. So what we're looking for is, you know, Y1, we would have six of these in our data because we've got six values of Y and six values of X. I just did three for the convenience of this. What we're looking for, we're looking for A, the slope, and B, the intercept of the inverted data so that we end up with um, the right-hand side being approximately equal to the left-hand side. That's what we're looking for. Okay? And what I'm doing right now is just the setup to show you how you get this into a matrix form so we can use MATLAB. So the observation is this set of the system of linear equations, the, these block things are intended to be matrices. So this is the same thing as this. This is a three by one matrix, and we've got this over here as well. And the observation is that these two matrices here, we can really combine into a single matrix. And so it's the same thing as then multiplying by this other matrix over here, which has our parameters. These are the things we want to estimate. And so what we've done here is if we can set up a matrix so that we have it in this augmented form, then we've got this kind of linear equation, and then we can solve for it. So. Um, uh, here's an example here. Here's what we want, this augmented matrix. This is the inverted data that we computed before, but that one dot slash data. Um, here's that, you know, the TF underscore data is what I call the transform data. So the, the X value, which is the first column of the transform data, that's going to be um, this over here, which is actually going to be this value over here. This is the augmented matrix. Um, and so the, this value over here is the X uh, as found over here, and then Y will be, I'll be using that later. 
Okay, and what we want is we want to take that x value there and we want to add a 1 over here so we end up with this, this augmented matrix. Okay? And the way we do it is we create a um, column of 1s and then we just append uh, the, the 1s to, and, and the x together. And you've seen that kind of thing before. This kind of operation, these data structure manipulations are really the key part of almost any programming language. And that's why it's important to sort of explore this with MATLAB, even though there are much easier ways to get the, the least squares fit than what I'm describing. Okay? Does that make sense? What we're doing is we want to create this. We've got this. So we create a, a, row, a vector of ones and then we have, uh, over here, and then we... Uh, we do this construct over here where it's one, one space x, and that appends the column of ones to this column of x's. That makes sense so far? Okay. Again, data structure manipulations are really the crucial part of most any language. Okay. So now we get to the next part here where we want to do the fit. Now we've got everything in a matrix form, and this is a really nice way uh, MATLAB deals with this kind of matrix form very well. Um, and so one thing that's perfectly reasonable for us to do, we want to try and estimate A and B, right? So um, we're, we're trying to figure out, well, how do we estimate that? Um, so one approach is we could use some formal technique. Um, but another approach is we could just, uh, well, okay, so this is just showing that, you know, B will become the y-intercept, or 1 over is the y-intercept, and A is going to be the slope. Okay. So how do we fit the data? Well, one approach is we've got this matrix over here. Uh, we could just guess. We, if we put in values for B and A, then we could see how well they fit. And in fact, the way B and A are computed, well, we know what B is. B is 1 over V max, and A is this ratio over here. So we could either pick values for B and A, or we could pick values for KM and V max, whatever we want to do it, and we could plot it. We could do a guess. Okay, that's one approach, right? Not a very good approach, but it's one approach. The reason why I say this is you will encounter problems sometimes where you don't have a nice model like Michaela's Menton. You have something else, and you're just trying to figure it out with some linearized form. And guessing is not necessarily bad to give you a feeling for what's going on. So, or you may get into a certain region of the space with some sort of optimization technique, but it's not giving you exactly what you want, and you may want to explore a little bit. So it is, it is a, a reasonable approach to, to doing this kind of thing. But clearly, this didn't work very well because you look at why, why does why do I say this is a poor fit? If you go back a sec, why don't I like that line? Look at the relationship between the line and the data, the circles. A good fit. What would you look for in a good fit of the line to the data? Yeah, yeah, you'd sort of want it in the middle, and this is off at a skew, so that's not so good. Okay, so least squares is the way we're going to go with this. Again, there are many ways to do this. The way I'm going to do it is take advantage of basically the definition of least squares. So let's sort of tease this apart. So X aug is the augmented matrix, the one with the column of ones and then the column of the X values. And so um, what we've got here, let's start from the inside out because you will see, if you do any programming in MATLAB, you'll see stuff like this all the time. You have to sort of tease apart what does it mean. So this is the augmented matrix. What does the prime here do? It's a transpose. This is not the best way to do it because if you're dealing with complex numbers, probably should be dot, you know, transpose. That would make it so that we're you know, doing, but but it is a transpose. That's what's going on there. We know these are all real numbers. We're not too worried about the concept, complex conjugates. Okay, so that's transpose. Um, times is times, and then x hog. Do you know what this product is? Well, you know what it's going to. Its shape is going to be, don't you? It's going to be square, right? Okay, and, and um, this is, is the, um, called the covariance matrix, where you're basically multiplying the x's times the x's, and you're getting up into sums of squares. Um, okay, this over here is, um, uh, this, this shows, uh, essentially is giving you correlations over here between y values and x values. And then this, this inverse over here um, is then used as part of the least squares calculation to then come up with the values for the A and B estimates. But th from your point of view, what you want to tease apart is what are the shapes as you go along? That will be probably the crucial thing in terms of understanding data structures. So you saw that you know, this is something you know, n by m, this is m by n, this is going to be square. Um, y has the same, is, is um, um, 
uh, has the same has the same number of co of rows as x. So then this transpose over here has the same number of columns as y. So this is going to make sense over here. And so then you can tease apart that this whole thing sort of makes sense altogether. Okay. Questions. All right. Good. All right. So then if we use this least squares estimate, then that red line looks a lot better. Now, you don't have to know, and typically you won't know for many of these things, the details of some of these calculations. You'll typically be looking at a paper, and you'll understand basically what someone did, you know, sort of be copying down and maybe translating their mathematical representation into some MATLAB code. That part is very common, because there may be just some limits to the depth of knowledge, and you want to use sort of, you know, this is considered you know, the, the, the best way to do something. You know, it might be in chemistry, it might be in biology. But what is very important is to understand the data structures, because that, that will be uh, problematic if, if those, you know, that's just free source of errors. And in terms of the science side, typically what you're looking for is once you've done it with, with you know, done that translation, you'll want to go back to the paper and look at what data did they use, and you get the same answers that they got and then try it on your data or other sort of consistency checks and validations. Okay, so then what we've got over here is um, a, um, a function that does exactly this calculation, this um, least squares estimate. And so what is the, uh, what's the argument? What's the input to this function? So where's, where's the function declared? Which line? One. Okay, so this is a declaration line. Okay, what's the name of the function? Yeah, mm underscore s. Okay, what's the argument? How many arguments? One argument. What's the argument? Data. What's the what's the how does data look? What's its shape? It's a, in this case, it doesn't. It, it's described yeah. as as basically it is going to be n by two. You don't know how big n is. It doesn't specify. It doesn't really even matter. Okay. Um, what is what's the output from this function? What's the output? What's the result? Km and vmax, right? And you know that by looking right over here. Right now, data being yes. It, it, it doesn't have to be a copy. It's a different shape. Yeah, so this is th these are scalars here. And so what you're going to have is, well, what will be the shape of the result? It's going to be one row and two columns. If I, put, if I put a comma in there, it would still be one row, two columns. How about if I put a semicolon in there? Right, it's, it's going to then be uh, one column and two rows. Because I'm, I'm just shaping the matrix if I put a, a, a semicolon there. Right? So the thing to look for then, this is what it takes in. And when you analyze a function, this is what you do. What does it take in and what does it put out? It takes in data and it puts out KM and Vmax. Right. Right, so then the last part is to plot the fitted estimates. Okay? And I give you some hints here about how to go through that. This is really common. You've gotten fragments of code. To do, to do this, you've got all, most of the pieces there. It's just a little bit that's, that's missing to fit that all together. Um, and give you some hints about how to do that. That's, that's your homework, is to complete that, to do the plot. The plot should look something like this. It's always satisfying when you come up with something that fits reasonably well. Okay, and so you'll use some of the plotting skills that you, we described. So you, you will be able to. Um, um, you're going to have to overlay, you're going to have the raw data scatter plot, which you know, is part of the code you've already seen, and you're going to overlay that with um, a plot of the uh, Michaelis Menten model using the Vmax and Km from this estimate. And so the one thing that I haven't shown explicitly is you've, you know, see how to, this is a function that, that computes the estimate, but it's, um, I haven't shown you how it is then you do a plot of the estimated values from Michaelis Menten, this line over here, given Vmax and Km. Right? So you know you're going to have to use the Michaelis Menten formula to do this. Right? And then you have to do it at each value of the x axis, where you know, there's a circle here. And those will become your lines. And you'll have to overlay that using hold on and hold off. Okay? 
questions? Yes. Okay, so it's due, it will be due a week from today at midnight, and homework three will be due on Wednesday at midnight. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I think, yeah, or, or a, a Google Doc, you know, whatever is most convenient for you. Just something that's easy. It could be a text file. Typically, they're going to be relatively short. I mean, I'm, I'm expecting only a few sentences. Yes, they should be in the repository. Okay, you want in a text file? That's the request? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So we're consistent? Okay. Yeah, text file in the repository. And so something like, you know, just say homework and dot text. Okay. Other questions? Okay, great. All right. Thank you.